So this is great. Hey, everybody. Happy Friday. Uh, it's Nick Slavic, proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company, also the host of this show, Ask a Painter Live. And I am here today joined by Jason Miller, fellow Minnesota painter, and we are going to get after it here. But first, I want to thank uh, the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association, for being an underwriter of the show. Uh, and they also provide a contract question of the week. There's a link to join the PCA and the show notes here. But uh, the PCA sent along the question, what is top of mind business-wise in painting businesses right now? And uh, Jason, I'll give you a chance. If, if you got anything top of mind, you let me know. Otherwise, I definitely have a top of mind right now. I'll let you start it. Yeah, so, I mean, we're still kind of in the throes of COVID. And uh, it seems like we, you know, six months ago, it was uncertainty and nobody knew what to do. I feel now we have some data and we can do something. We can have plans to work safely. I saw you wearing a mask. There's certain things we can do to make our clients feel safe and us feel safe. But I'm wondering about the next cold and flu season because there are no symptoms that distinguish COVID from cold and flu. So what happens now? It's coming. We're in Minnesota, man. We're four months away from cold and flu season. Well, I mean, how are we supposed to think about this? I kind of wonder if people are going to be more diligent about protecting themselves from the regular flu this year, you know. Uh, we, we could never get people to wear a mask to protect themselves uh, or each other from the flu before, but uh, I think this year we're probably going to be hyper vigilant on everything, I would think. So it might actually be a good change. You know, there's uh, big world events. There's there's changes with 9-11. It was sort of airport security, things like that. Maybe with this, maybe we'll just be a little more conscious about just basic sanit uh, sanitizing, basic health things like that. I mean, you could look to Japan. We, we laugh at Japan for years, for decades. Everybody's wearing masks and things like that. Doesn't seem so stupid now. Just basic, like, common sense sort of things. Yeah, maybe we'll catch up there. Um, I know you've covered this a lot over the last few months, like how things are going with COVID. I haven't been able to stay as informed because I've been too stinking busy painting myself. So, like, how is it going with larger crews? I'm just a one-man operation, so it's obviously still going okay for me. I'm still working every day. Um, what's the latest? Yeah, so the, the reality on the ground is one to two to three person painting companies, they have more work than they can handle. Most in rural Minnesota and other parts. Honestly, when I talk to painters, their clients really don't care and the painters don't care and they kind of go on like normal for good or for bad. I, it, they just sort of, they look around and if nobody makes them do something, they don't do something. Um, with this many people, you just have to be safe. I mean, it, you, you want to look out for everybody. The, the, the biggest attack vector in a business like mine is one person gets it. We happen to all be in the same room. The whole business gets shut down on an emergency basis for two weeks. And 25 people either don't have paychecks or clients get angry. So one of the things that I have to protect is an emergency unplanned shutdown. So basically we do all the common sense things that everybody else does. We just have to be a little more diligent to keep people separated, keep people safe and, and working safely. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I wish I, I, a lot of it just comes down to common sense stuff, you know, really what it, what it is. So right on are a lot of crews like wearing masks or is it sort of a, all like we're working together every day. So we're all kind of, in the same pool. I mean, there's, I don't know how to approach it the best way. Well, and you know, when you boil it down, it gets really simple. It's basically like, there's things that the business has to do to keep people safe, which is, you know, have, have a policy, enforce it. And then basically 70% of it has to deal with my crash people. They have to wear masks no matter what. I mean, it's just like cell phones and cars. It's, it's, there's nothing in it for you to say, use your cell phone in a car. There's nothing in it for me to say, don't wear a mask. Um, just wear a mask. It's just easy. If you're doing business for our company, just wear a mask. It's not like we're not used to it. We wear respirators all the time. So it's not a big deal. Yep. Uh, people have to wash their hands, social distance, sanitize their tools every once in a while, and then report symptoms. Um, and as a company, I can provide all the safety equipment. I can make sure that our clients understand our systems of keeping safe. And then I can just say, after that, guys, I can't show up on every job site and make you wear a mask. You know, from here on out, if you have symptoms, there's only one recommendation by the CDC, which is two weeks of unpaid leave. So 
it's behoove of you to stay safe because you do not want an emergency unpaid two-week vacation, especially as we get closer to Christmas. So there's there's enough incentive to keep everybody safe around here. And I don't we all know that the best thing we can do is continuation of business. Business as normal, everybody has a full-time job. Clients are happy, and when that gets interrupted, it just causes a lot of stress for anybody. There's not a lot of good that comes out of it. Totally. Right on. So about, about the same for my operation. I mean, it's exactly. just wearing a mask. Uh, I'm kind of used to it at this point. Honestly, at the end of the day, when I don't have a feeling of a mask on my face or knee pads on my knees, I feel naked. <laughs> I've lived with that knee pad thing for years. It feels like every time I get out of my truck, the first thing I do, you get that itch. Like, oh, you got to put the knee pads on, you know, just yeah, like that. If I'm wearing jeans, I'll just have this feeling like I'm missing something. It's crazy. You feel so free without them sometimes, too. <laughs> it is. So, now, uh, you, I, I assume most of your work is farther towards the city center of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Is do you feel that you may deal with some of the COVID-related things maybe a little more than some of the rural painters? Uh, how is your feeling about that? Um, so I don't know. I mean, yeah, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and kind of the outer uh, suburbs. I'm in Plymouth right now. Um, I don't know that it's been a huge problem. I mean, I mean it's mostly residential things, and there will either be nobody home um, if it's a house that's for sale or somebody's just about to move in um, or like right now there's uh, homeowners here. So we just we just wear a mask and um, we're kind of working in different areas and um, it really hasn't been that big a deal. So I, I agree, man. And, and, you know, we all beat COVID to death. I don't know that there's a lot more we can add. We're sort of just all the uncertainty is getting smaller and smaller, but there's still uncertainty. And I think we all just need to react with what's going around. And uh, we all want to resume a normal life, but we also understand that that comes with some risks. And I think right now everybody's just kind of like tiptoeing a little bit saying, oh, just see what happens, right? Yeah, I think it, that's sort of been it. Like, all right, we'll take the simple precautions that seem to be the best. And otherwise, let's just live our lives and, and hope for the best. Agreed. Well, speaking about living lives, we want to hear about you because you do a whole bunch of super cool videos on social media about painting. And uh, it, I'm always, it, it's like a dog whistle to guys like me because somebody who is intentional about showing really interesting things that elevate the trade and do it in a really artful way, that's my dog whistle. I'm very interested. So you've been on my radar for a little bit. So we want to hear about you because it, it, when, when you look at Jason Miller uh, on social media, you see a lot of music related things. So tell us, tell us, I mean, are you a Minnesota guy, born and raised, music background? Tell us, tell us all. Okay, wow. Yeah, that was my former life. I am Minnesota, born and raised, originally from Mankato. Um, and then I, I moved to Minneapolis, and I was in the music business for uh, a little over 10 years. I was on the recording studio side of things. So I was a freelance recording engineer, making records. Uh, I moved to Nashville for a while, from 2010 to 2014. I was making records down there. That was a cool experience. Um, came back here in 2014, and shortly thereafter, I actually started working for Prince. So I was the last sort of on-call engineer at Paisley Park. And um, so I was around there for about the last year and a half of his life, um, wow. just on call, sort of as needed, because he just, that's how he operated. So um, tell us, I mean, Minnesota Icon, we have to ask, what is it like working there? What is it like being near him? Tell us something, Jason Miller. Oh, man. I haven't thought about this in a second. Um, it was, I mean, it was surreal. It was every bit as surreal as you would think it is. Um, that was back before, you know, he was still around, before Paisley Park is a museum. So when I would go there, it would, you know, be at night. The place would be dark. There'd maybe be five people in the building. And uh, it was always just very quiet. And I'd be there doing my thing. Wouldn't know if he was there or not. And then he'd just show up around the corner. And um, it was... Uh, it was something. I mean, people do talk about his height and how he was a really short guy, but holy crap, that dude was the biggest guy in the room. Just such <laughs> a huge presence to him. It's it's all real. And so, I mean, your your main job there just kind of working when when him and other people are in there doing their thing, you're just sort of facilitating it, or how, how did it all work? 
Well, so that's how it would normally be with most people. With him, it was a unique situation because he actually uh, recorded himself in that he operated everything and he played every instrument. Uh, it was also unique with him because he was still recording to uh, two-inch analog tape. So just like our two-inch painter's tape, that's how wide that stuff is, except it comes on big ten-and-a-half-inch reels. So he still had the old tape machines. It's 24 tracks. Um, so what I would do most of the time for him is I would go out there and set everything up, drums, bass, guitar, keyboard, piano, vocal mic, um, drum machine, everything that he needed, get it all hooked up, get it making sounds, get it sounding good, get everything routed exactly how it has to be, get fresh tape loaded on his machine, make sure everything's working, cross your fingers, say a little prayer, and leave, and then uh, he would record himself overnight by himself. Wow. Um, so I would leave with empty tape. Um, a reel of tape would hold 15 minutes of audio uh, with 24 tracks, so basically 24 different instruments. And overnight, he would fill it up himself. And sometimes I would come back the next day and I would then transfer what was recorded on that tape to a uh, digital, uh, digital audio system to hand it off to somebody else. So yeah, that dude was a monster. That's incredible. And that, that was a normal routine for him. Yep. That's just how he worked. And he was living there in, you know, Paisley Park, 55,000 square foot uh, compound. Um, so yeah, we had some crazy nights, got yelled at a couple times, but I, that's okay. I understood what I was dealing with. Um, yeah, he wasn't like a jerk or anything. He was just very demanding. But he was operating on a, a talent level. You know, that, that's just, it is what it is. It comes with the territory. So is there one, is there one, I won't beat it to death, but is there any one musical memory that you'll take away? Just this, you know, enlightenment, a moment of enlightenment, just something you heard or saw that you'll remember or still think about? Um... You know, that uh, I haven't really thought about that in a while. Um, but one thing that really struck me about him was his um, attention to uh, detail, attention to perfection, and attention to the final product. And for him, his methods of getting music recorded um, were sometimes wrong or um, just unorthodox. Um, but ultimately, does, does the final product sound good? Answer is, you know, yes. And, um, man, I think there was one night when we were in the control room and I think the drummer, cause it was just him and another drummer that were going to be jamming and the drummer was kind of dialing in the drum kit. So I'm sitting in the control room and Prince is, um, over on the other couch and he's just shredding on a bass guitar, just killing time. And, uh, I said something totally stupid, like, uh, wow, you're really good. <laughs> and, which is such a stupid thing to say to friends and um then he kind of went into a thing and he said uh you know i play a lot of instruments i think it's important to master your craft and uh then he said i don't play saxophone though no, i always hire that out <laughs> so okay i guess you got to know your limits but that was him he was constantly mastering his craft there was never a point where it's like okay now i'm, I'm good enough he was always trying to better himself and that's, that's cool, because there's always something to be learned no matter what you're doing, whether you're a musician, whether you're a painter, there's always something new to be learned. There's always room for improvement. Yeah, man, super inspirational. And, and you know, we can, we can appreciate, when I see anybody good at their craft, like the, the dudes who laid the block for this building, masters. And I was just in awe of watching them. I mean, the same way you were watching Prince, like anybody who's good at what they do, it yeah. inspires you. And you just oh. want to do better. Yep, and I so, get that way now watching internet videos of, of yourself and other painters, and I'm like, dang, man, let's kick it into high gear here. So how did, how did you get into painting then? Okay, so the music business is a terrible, awful business filled with uh, heartache <laughs> and just. So it's already, it's been bad for a while. It's already bad, and it's only just going to get worse. So wow. um, I've continued as a uh, freelance engineer after Prince uh, passed away. And in fact, I was, uh, I still do help out at Paisley Park uh, maintaining the studios. And, and I thought, you know, maybe there could be a future there, but it occurred to me 
uh, last, just this last December, that um, there just really is not going to be like a 30 year future in this business. At some point, it's just all going to fall apart and I'm going to have to figure something else out. So I have my moment. Uh, my dad started his handyman business when he was in his like mid 40s, I think. And um, being in the music business, that means, of course, I worked for my dad in his handyman business plenty. And um, he always said, you know, you could be a handyman. And I was on, you know, I, I, I fought him on that. But then I, I had my moment where I'm like, screw it. I'm going to be a handyman. And um, that's what I decided on in December. I hopped online to, um, to just kind of brush up on some painting techniques. Pun was not intended, but I'm going to intend it now. That's and awesome. um, I came, the first thing that I came across was one of Chris Berry's videos, an Idaho painter video. And uh, I forget what it was. It was one of his older videos, like iPhone camera production, basically. I forget exactly what it was, but it was probably like a three minute video where he just showed you how to do a thing. And I was like, that's cool. And I clicked on another video. And after that, I was like, man, screw being a handyman. I'm going to be a painter because I've painted a lot with my dad. And I would say that's like the one thing that I really enjoyed and sort of had a, a penchant for. So I probably watched hours and hours of Idaho painter videos and I kind of learned a lot and I made a logo and by January 1st started my business. So here it is, August, been doing it for eight and a half months. Well, what a year, huh? <laughs> yeah, what a year to start. But you know what? It's um, it's been great. I mean, everything fell apart for like a what a month, month and a half there. But um, once it picked back up for me, it picked back up completely. So it's going great. Well, what was interesting is you know I started my business in 2007, and if you're a contractor or in the housing market, it wasn't a great time do that but you know that, that youthful labor and, and uh, ignorance of bliss I had no idea it didn't matter I didn't even think about it and likewise it's like you know we just take cues from what's around us and sometimes starting a business in a time like this is good because you're never gonna have more grit than that yeah yeah it's um you know it's been okay for me the first couple months was kind of like starting any business getting the word out there'd be fortunately as a painter the demand is crazy so simply making the announcement to friends and family is enough to stir up a couple real jobs. And, uh, you know, things were getting booked and it was cool. And then, um, yeah, everything totally fell apart. Um, but that's cool. We just wrote it out and knew it was going to get better at some point, And it did. And um, it's been totally awesome. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few of the videos you've done recently, because, again, these are my dog whistles. When I see these, it, it perks my interest, and I start looking around. So number one, you peel dried paint out of a bucket, which is, I could watch a thousand of those. I mean, ASMR, satisfying videos, all that stuff. Like, I could put those on a loop and just stare at peeling paint out of plastic buckets. So hats off. You, I mean, if that, if that does something for you, we can hang out. Like, that's right. Yeah, I love that. Uh, also, um, frame primer, new construction. Must have been an older house. I saw some slanted uh, roofs. You were doing new drywall? That was a farmhouse. And um, yeah, old farmhouse, probably 1950s, maybe 40s even. Um, and they remodeled some of the upstairs there. So, uh, yep, new drywall. And I used uh, your priming technique for that. Uh, because normally I was spraying and then back rolling until, uh, what was it, a month or two ago, you insisted um, if everything's prepped right, just go ahead and uh, and spray it, sand it later. And I did, and it worked great. It's it's like, what primer did you use on that? Um, that was um, Sherwin's kind of standard primer. Okay. What's yeah, that's, I mean, listen, when you, when you sand that stuff and then you apply top coat, that stuff's like marble. It, it just doesn't absorb anything. It, it goes on so slick. And yeah, I don't know. I've tried everything and I can't find a reason to back roll your primer, honestly. <laughs> yeah, there was, um, there was one spot because uh, I got to admit, man, the mutters, boy, were they messy and they left a mess. So there was, there was a lot of dust to be cleaned. And there was one spot that must have gotten uh, missed on the drywall and uh, it peeled off, I think, after maybe putting the first uh, top coat on there. 
just a, just a small section. Um, yeah. But once it peeled off, you can feel there's a little dust under there. So if you do it that way, just make sure your walls are darn clean. So what's interesting is that all the trades are different and drywallers are sometimes our nemesis because we're judged on their work and it seems like there's not a light inspection after a lot of their work. So I ran into a job where I was having some drywall done and I just asked the drywaller, I said like, um, here's my expectations for the job. Uh, cover the floors, cover the windows and just get rid of your garbage. And what do you think he told me? No. Oh. Wow. I won't like, I'm not going to do it. And I was like, that's an option. That is insane. Like what if a client said, Hey, I would like you to take my woodwork and put drop cloths on my furniture. And I, you, can you just say no? I don't think that would ever fly. So I drywallers frustrate, frustrate me to no end, man. I just hate it. I'm, so, I'm still learning that because I haven't had to deal with a whole lot of that. So I don't really know what the standard or uh, expectation is. I mean, for me, when I come into a house, if it's a clean house, even if it's a new construction, if it's a clean uh, job site, I'm going to clean up all my mess. If there's any paint spills or anything, that's all going to get uh, touched up, cleaned up, and, and I'm going to leave it uh, nice. I've encountered a couple where it's kind of just a dusty mess, and I don't know, maybe that's normal. It just seems to me that dust is sort of a byproduct of that job, just like paint spills are a byproduct of mine. Um, so it's interesting, the, one, of, one of the best drywallers that I know, his definition of cleanup is vacuuming around the edge of the drywall, but leaving all the middle of the room still covered with dust. It's like... So, hey, and on that topic, I am looking for the most awesome um, dust extractor attachment I can possibly find for scraping a wide path on some drywall and, uh, and freeing it of its dust. What's the best one? Oh man, listen, I have, okay. <laughs> I have tried everything you can do to rub over drywall to remove um, dust. Uh, obviously we start off with those dust mops. Wooster makes one, 360 makes one, you know, where you just put it on there, you dust it off. It's fine, but it just creates a lot of dust and you kind of just move it around and every two walls you gotta shake it off outside. I've tried to make all sorts of crazy three to four foot dust extractors that you roll over a wall. Drywall, especially nowadays with the super light board and the super light mud, anything you do to touch the walls will mark them or, or dent them. So we had to get away from that. Um, this is not perfect, but uh, I, <laughs> I use leaf blowers. <laughs> I just, get in, I just get in there and we just open up two windows. You put a fan on one end of the project, pushing air in. You put a fan on the other end, sucking air out. You fully mask up, no, no skin, no eyes, anything exposed. And you just get in with a leaf blower and just let it happen. Is that what it takes though? Has it really come to that? I'm thinking, why can't I have like a push broom head with the middle bristles carved out with a hose attachment? So you're essentially just brooming the sides but sucking up a lot of that dust and dang both of my dust extractors they've got a lot of suction they'll do some work but i've exactly. looked for products and i just can't find something i'm in love with no and you know what there's there's all solutions seem dumb like <laughs> pushing a mop over the wall or using a leaf blower but honestly if if you think about like bang for the buck and time and efficiency if we have a whole construction site to ourselves, honestly, that leaf blower, it's a killer, man. Um, if we did a whole house remodel where the, the family was living in the basement and we were doing the main floor, man, unless we covered all those air vents, I don't think it'd be viable. But yeah, that's what we've resorted to. Just And, and again, when you think about, there's sometimes there's the best solution but it may not be applicable to a whole bunch of young apprentices. And I get very nervous when you send somebody out to a new, you know, 7,000 square foot home. And if they touch the wall all over the wall, we might be re-skim coating all the walls if it's not done properly. So there's also that sort of weird thing. And I like your idea though. How has nobody put, no, no company put the, the effort into making such a tool? Push, start with push broom, make the bristles nice and soft, um, instead of having a, a wooden handle or a plastic handle, have a vacuum tube with some sort of universal vacuum. It. You just you hook it up to your dust extractor and you go to town. That might be nice on a floor too. Imagine if oh, you're but sucking at the same time. 
Listen, that that does a lot of stuff for guys like you and me because we like to be efficient and we like to be clean. And nothing kills me more than that dang leaf blower. Then you're just weaponizing all this dust. It does get it out of there quick. But at the same time, it's like, yes, I would love to go in there with a four foot wide thing. And every time you go like this, no dust in the air, super clean, super efficient. So I think that is your million dollar idea, Jason. I don't have time, man. I'm thinking wow. <laughs> That's not idea. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, there's uh, there's that you were spraying drywall primer, which again is super satisfying to watch. Um, uh, 3M wood filler on a window still, which is one of my favorite things on the face of this planet to do. I love watching that. Uh, I think that was just uh, images. Oh, um, that Bondo, yeah, that was a manufactured window still. <laughs> that window still had largely disappeared. But after I think maybe six rounds of Bondo. That thing was solid. And after painting it, I, 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 intentionally, it's an older house, I intentionally put some brush marks in there so it kind of looked like everything else. You cannot tell. It, the last time that I did that in mass is one of my favorite systems. I got to visit the 3M factory. They kind of showed me that uh, wood consolidator, wood hardener, and then the two-part wood filler system, which I think I, I, the 3M does bondo. I think you used the wood filler or did you use the straight bondo? I use the wood filler that, with the, the hardener. Yeah, that's my favorite stuff. I don't use straight Bondo anymore. It's, I love that wood filler stuff. We did a historical restoration two years ago, and I used 41 cans of that stuff all over the wood uh, stuff there. I had my little factory set up of mixing. I would mix a whole can at a time, and then I was using a plunger and stuff to, to put it into wood sills and things like this, and I did that for three days straight. I mean, it's super satisfying, but man, it's uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it's either that or you don't have a carpenter come in and replace all the windows, so yeah, it was right. cheaper that <laughs> And with those old houses where everything is kind of like built in, I mean, replacing that would have been quite a task. That's what they wanted to do first. And I'm like, yeah, I don't think you understand what you're getting into to actually just replace that one piece of wood. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's not rip it out, put it in. It affects everything. And uh, yeah, especially on the older houses, you know, everything is non-standard dimensional. The one that I was working on was brick. So and it had a whole bunch of like, you know, the window sills were this thick. So it's like good luck finding any of that stuff. So. All right. Yeah, that product is amazing. Um, I think you could make almost anything with it. I want to figure out some good Bondo accessories to go with that, a little sculpting package. One thing, maybe you know of something, one thing I wish I had were like, you know, semi-solid Teflon strips or something so that you can essentially tape some like corners up and cram it in and fill it and then peel the strips away and have something fully filled. Because for me with that sill, I probably could have done that in maybe two or three if I had some sort of a a mold to put it into, but I had to just build a little by little and then fill it in. Listen, there's got to be, you know, I'm, I'm sure if you look through Uline, have you ever heard of that company Uline yeah. that sells car? Yeah. Their catalog is this thing. If you got two days to look through that, I guarantee there's got to be something in there, man. There's got to yeah. be some weak roll of nylon, something that we can use, but that is genius. I love that. Because listen, I, I know you've probably done this before too, but five gallon paint sticks. <laughs> They've done a lot of things on job sites, man, and it sticks to the bondo, but in a pinch, you know? <laughs> I, yeah, I think the most recent time I used one was as a brush handle extender. Tape it on there so I could get above some cabinets and cut in some uh, some corners. <laughs> Worked great. It was a little wild, uh -oh. but once you got used to the feel, it was fine. I love that. So uh, the, the two last videos that I love watching, again, props to you. If you don't follow Jason, follow Jason. Um, obviously, you got to go, if you're a painter and you care, you've got to go frog tape, cutting the line, peeling the paint off, right? So you were doing some green paint. You had the yellow frog tape. I mean, again, between that and the bucket video peeling off the old paint, I could watch a series of those over and over again. <laughs> yeah, so I found that it's not just you. There's a lot of people that feel that same way. And that's, um, that's kind of how the videos all started. I think I just posted a spray one just for fun. And a lot of people were like, oh, man, that's so satisfying. So I just I kept doing it. And now there's sort of a an audience of people who just um, they kind of stay tuned and they like seeing fun things like that. And I'm happy to film it for them if that's what they want to see. It, it generates business. What's been really interesting to me is with the advent of TikTok. 
um, it, you reach into a whole other audience. And, and one of my friends, Zach Kenny from out east, a uh, huge following on Instagram, very popular on, on TikTok. He tapped into the youth of America by using a five in one tool, which I saw in your hand, scraping the paint out of a roller. Somehow that scratched the biggest itch with people oh, who want videos. And it's one. I know some a people million. Are, I'm, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's a, good a million one. views. The, the only way to make it better is get a better color paint. Get the craziest color paint you've ever seen and make it a little artful. And it's just, it's amazing what people find satisfying. You know, a lot of things we do, we take for granted. They're super satisfying to see. You know? Yeah, I think if, um, all right, here's the video. You're right. Cool paint color, 18 inch roller and, and, <sighs> and, and do it into like a little pint cup and you'll probably fill the thing like just perfectly. I think it'll blow minds. I love that. And obviously you got to be dressed in something extravagant. There's got to be a great soundtrack over it. And yeah, listen, man, I, I think this is going to work. <laughs> it, too bad none of our clients are on TikTok. You know, I don't think we have the 45 year plus homeowner on there, but uh, we'll get there. Yeah, I, th I have not uh, gone into the TikTok world yet. I don't know a whole lot about it. I think I'm just going to stick with my Instagram. It's easy and uh, it's all I really have time for. Do that, man. That's a good thing. So, uh, and I will say one thing, props to you. Uh, I incorporated, I stole some of your content and I incorporated it in, uh, in my SOP for deck finishing. I had messaged you about this too. You, you were, you were spraying some green, uh, stain, no green paint. You were using duration. I think you were, uh, over some really cool kind of, uh, deck oh, yeah. railings like that. Yeah had your cardboard with wood set up so it's like a backstop for the overspray i was like oh man that is just again satisfying to watch but i've not videoed that or pictured it or anything so i screenshotted that thing i threw it in the sop and i showed all my guys so kudos man i love that well okay done. that's great because i've stolen plenty of stuff from you so you can have it <laughs> Dude, I, I love that though. And it's one of those things where, you know, it would, it would take me a half a day to stage one of those things. And it's like, oh, this guy did it. And it's perfect. And it looks really good. So uh, sorry, Jason, but uh, you're commemorized in my SOP for how long. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome to it. So I actually, um, I put some masking film over top of that cardboard as well, because um, it was just going to get caked and I wanted to be able to reuse my piece of cardboard. That masking film, by the time I was done, mind you, this is two coats of Peel Bond primer and then two top coats. And I think there were maybe like 10 or 15 sections and I moved it for each section. So by the time I pulled that masking film off, it was as thick as a tarp. Oh, I can't imagine 40, 50 coats of paint on that thing and, and thick coatings too you were using. So <laughs> yeah, that Peel Bond really, uh, really got it there. I sh if I knew it was going to be like that, I would have made a video on it. Dude, I love that man. So, well, Jason, I mean, what else? What else is on your mind? You you started started a business in the time of COVID. You're making awesome videos. I mean, what what is what is exciting for you going forward now? What what's on your mind as a as a business owner and a tradesperson and now a content creator? Um, man, it's just fun uh, being busy and seeing the different projects. I mean, I'm still getting my feet wet in it. I have not experienced everything that there is. To experience um as far as the content creation goes i'm really uh i had no aspirations of being uh, a painting internet sensation by any stretch of the imagination i'll leave that to you and and others um for me i'm really just interested in the local audience because it uh it stirs things up and it makes people want paint jobs and uh instagram for me has actually been my number one uh lead generator is people who found me on there so um that's been fun it's fun that that keeps uh working um i don't know what else there is to uh to say about all that so uh last thing is uh we were following along intently and you actually posted in the gathering of minnesota painters you were skim coating some ceilings is that the project you're on now or is that a different one yeah so what i'm doing right now with this house in plymouth they're doing a really cool um they're doing a really cool renovation of this uh, it seems like it must be a mid-century uh home um, but of course it had popcorn ceilings, uh, 1700 square feet of popcorn ceilings. So, uh, we've kind of divided the house in half cause the homeowners are still here living and, and working. Um, so I've sealed it off with plastic and we just did the first chunk and, um, yeah, I've been doing more popcorn ceilings. I just picked up a, uh, a Merca Liros 
That is my new favorite tool. I love that sander. Um, so I've been doing the grinding and then skim coating. So um, the next thing for me is to get good at skim coating fast. So I'm really curious about rolling mud on and then um, using a big old wide knife and just getting it done real quick. Yeah, listen, man, we, and, and that's what you posted about the gathering of Minnesota painters about looking for some perspective. And uh, it's been, it, it's really interesting watching, like, you know, I mentioned the Brazilian painters. The Brazilians go after this. All they do is roll on mud and they use like arrows and stuff like that, three and four foot wide blades, and just pull that mud. Ceilings, balls, they use the blades on, on poles and go across the ceiling. I, I thought about that exactly. There's thousands of those things. I love that sort of thing. The only other iteration of that is something I mentioned, which is using a texture sprayer. In my old historic home we just sold, there was like 20 layers of paint, uh, wallpaper encapsulated between layers of paint. And I was digging through it and pretty soon it just got to be too crazy. We got down to lead paint, milk paint, things like that. So what I did is at that time, I had a drywall color come in and he we taped everything off just like you were doing. And he sprayed the walls just like you were gonna do a knockdown texture. Only we just took those 12 inch blades and just wiped it all yeah. smooth like that. And on, we could do a bedroom in like 20 minutes. It was the fastest thing ever when you got that system dialed in. What's the mess like with that sprayer and the cleanup? Yeah, you wanna cover everything. It is a disaster. <laughs> and like, you want multiple layers of floor, floor protection. So like, we have a couple drywallers on staff now in the company, and what they do, excuse me, I got the So what they do is uh, two layers of floor protection. They go plastic down first, mm -hmm. then they go uh, paper. Then the paper will absorb a lot of the moisture in the mud but then the plastic will keep dust. So, sure. I mean, it, and it's a wear layer. As soon as they're done, uh, as soon as they're done putting the texture on and everything's dry, they take up one layer of floor protection, then you have the other one down. Cool. That's, um, I'll need to figure out the best system for that too, but uh, there's, my God, how many square feet of popcorn ceilings are there in the world that are yet to be removed? We're millennializing homes these days. Um, white like ceiling, flat ceilings. So, if a person can get good at that and do it quick, uh, there's there's gold in them popcorn ceilings. Right. Uh, your method for removing popcorn. Do you prefer dry? Do you prefer wet? Uh, does it matter on the ceiling? Okay, so I've done it all, and I. It's not. It's not super clean, but I absolutely prefer just going after it with the Merca. Um, I used three freaking bags, um, in that vacuum, removing that popcorn. So it sucks up a lot. Clearly those things fill up. Um, it will still make a dry mess all over the room, but that dry mess cleans up pretty quickly, especially if you've got stuff covered. I mean, I mask off doors, I mask off vents, I mask off windows. Um, the, most of the flooring here is to be replaced. So, uh, I just left it hard because you can sweep up and vacuum up pretty easily, but otherwise uh, throw a drop cloth down. So I found that I could um, grind the popcorn off and have a bedroom clean in 30 minutes. Nice, man. And then I'm on to skim coating. Um, so that's, that's great. Now, if I could get two skim coats on in a day, which I can, if I could do that in multiple rooms with a big skimmer, that would be killer. Um, Boy, the dream world for me would be if I could uh, get a primer on on that first day. I don't know. If yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if that's doable. Yeah, I know that. Um, you know, my my drywaller always cautions me against pushing that sort of thing. He's like, you want to get that mud to breathe because if you ever want paint to bubble, put it on mud that's not fully cured. <laughs> yeah. Well, so that's been my thing is finding that right mud combination, but it's probably not in the stars. Otherwise, I can get primer and two ceiling coats on the next day. So as long as I can get both uh, mud coats on that first day, I can turn a couple rooms around real quick. So I'll, I'll be curious to follow up with you. Um, what mud you end up using for rolling, how much you thin it, what do you put it on with? Because that's, I mean, that honestly is like the quick and dirty because sometimes it stinks carrying out an air compressor, a texture sprayer and all that. It's like, yeah, I mean, quick and dirty, getting some mud on with a roller is kind of the way to go. Yeah, I'd probably do that just because it's, it's small, it's cheap, it's easy technology. You don't need electricity. 
Um, you know, so far with everything that I've skimmed with, and I'm not, you know, super big into mudding, but I've done it a bit. Um, that regular, like, dark green lid, general purpose joint compound in those heavy, heavy buckets takes a while to dry. But dang, that stuff goes on smooth. And you can really get it smooth with a knife uh, super easily. Um, it seems to set up pretty fast so that you can still get a good surface tension on the stuff that you just skimmed and, and keep everything flat. So I like it takes a long time to dry, even if you get fans on it. But I like that stuff a lot. Well, respect for using that stuff. That's the good stuff because uh, there's way too much. It, just when you think they can't make a lighter weight mud, every year they come up with something where now you can you can pick up four or five of those buckets now of mud. I don't know what's in them. It, it's just, it's insane now. So I used um, that lightweight stuff with the, the light green lid um, doing some seams. I didn't buy the bucket. They just had it. And I was not, I don't know if I'm just doing it wrong. I wasn't a fan at all. This uh, this dark green lid, I mean, it's like buttercream frosting, nice and thick and smooth. And that other stuff was like sugar frosting, where it's got a lot of holes and pits and stuff when you drag it across. You just couldn't get it nice. So I'm not into that. No, I agree, man. It's quality versus the quantity thing again. It's like, yes, it is lighter weight. It probably dries a little faster, but God, it's not as good, man. It's just not as good. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to roll with that. And it's the <laughs> final product, but it's also working with it. I don't want I, – I want all stuff that's easy for me to work with so I can just keep going. I'm a one-man job. I don't want to hurt myself. I don't want to work harder than I have to. I'm already working hard enough. Nice, man. Well, do you have any final thoughts, final words, final anything before we cut her off today? Because both of us got stuff to do. I don't want to hold you up. I uh, don't know if I do. I appreciate you inviting me on. This is very fun. Just love, uh, love being a painter, man. This is the uh, this is the smartest thing I've done in my whole life. Is decide to be a painter. Nice. Positive. Dude, that's awesome, man. It's been fun following you, uh, especially being another uh, Minnesota guy here. Hopefully, we can see you at one of the gatherings of uh, Minnesota painters. I'd love to press the flag. And uh, yeah, man, I, I can't wait to see all the videos and stuff. So. Thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for having me. Appreciate it. All right, man. Have a good day and have a good weekend, too. All right. Sounds good. We'll catch you later. All right, everybody. Thanks for watching the Ask a Painter show. Uh, thank you to the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association. Uh, Jason's the best, man. If you don't follow him, go look for his videos. It's super satisfying to watch. The Painting Contractors Association, there's guys like me, there's guys like him, this is what we're here for. You heard him. The best decision he's ever made in his life. That's inspiring, man. It's the best decision I've ever made, too. And for people who want to start up a freedom machine, uh, more money, more time, more time with family, more happy people around you. Listen, if you want to talk about the American dream, this is about as close to the realization of that as possible as, uh, you know, determining your own destiny, making your own fortune, things like this, and, and putting a whole bunch of happy people around you. Uh, doing it. So if you want to be around more people like me and Jason, the PCA, the Painting Contractors Association is the place to be. I was inspired years ago by meeting the people there and it continues to this day. So uh, thanks everybody for watching today. Jason's awesome. Follow Jason. Uh, there's a link in the show notes if you want to join the PCA and uh, thanks everybody. Have a good weekend.